What is up, guys? Welcome to the Investor's Edge live stream, where we do real estate live Monday to Fridays at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today, we have a special guest with us. He's pretty special. He comes on every single Wednesday. Um, but this guy, he knows how to find leads, deals for free. It literally costs you nothing to find them when they're on the MLS. So in this video, Jacob is going to show you how to find deals on the MLS. You guys can ask questions in the side chat. And yeah, let's uh, let's let's so show some love for Jacob. Drop some heart emojis in the side chat. How's it going, bro? Pew, 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 pew. I'm doing Ooh. Gucci. How you doing? I'm doing good, bro. I'm doing really, really good. Let's think, get some freaking deals today. Dude, I, I think this is going to be a very valuable show to everybody because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of people in my audience, you know, they don't have a whole bunch of extra capital available to spend on like PPC marketing or like buying lists and cold calling mm -hmm. and BAs and whatnot. So this is really like, uh, you know, if somebody were to pick you up, put you in a random city with no money and a laptop, you could do this and you could you can make leads off of this. So I'm, I'm excited to see it, bro. For sure. So I'll go through um, Privy and then I'll also go through Zillow if we have time. But Ooh. first, let's run through some privy leads. Open this bad boy up. I'm trying to share my screen. Hold on. No, I lost it. Okay, there we are. Present. Share screen. Do a little privy action. You can see my screen. It's just loading. Oh, there we go. Now it's up. All right, Dude, cool. You have a long ass screen, bro. It's like a 32 inch. I got it and I realized it was too big because I got two of them and I was like, oh crap, I only need one. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is Privy. For those of you who aren't familiar with Privy, um, it's literally a tool that scrapes the MLS basically. So long story short, it has like an algorithm that kind of runs it against <coughs> other properties that have been fully updated. So if the ARV of a fully updated property is you know, 300,000 and our properties at 100,000 or 150,000 or whatever we set it to, it's going to tag that property and say, hey, we think this is a potential deal for you. Um, so it pretty much narrows down scrubbing through every single listing to try to find out which one's outdated to really be only looking at outdated properties for the most part. So once we get into Privy, um, and dude, what's, what's all do? that blue and red and yellow on the map? What what does that stuff mean? Yeah, so all of the so all of this is going to be your different um, MLS data providers. So all of the uh, blue right here is <clears throat> stuff. <clears throat> excuse me, stuff coming from the actual MLS. Um, so it's not coming from like a third party database. It's coming directly from that MLS service within that market. So you can see that's pretty much all the major markets right now. Um, the reddish orange is going to be coming soon. So those are stuff that they don't have access to the MLS directly as of right now, but it is in the process. So again, you can see a lot of the major cities are starting to get access that don't if they don't already. And then the yellow is going to be um, third party listing data. So it's not directly from the MLS, but they're pulling it from another company who is directly in connect with the MLS. At least that's to my understanding. And then anything that doesn't have those colors, you can probably just assume that it's not in your market. Unfortunately, you can still get tax data information or tax record information, but you're not going to be able to have um, that listing information that we're going through. So I, I like the fact that Florida is just completely covered in blue. <laughs> yeah, right. Florida is and, just blue. And you're doing deals in Jacksonville. So I want to I want to <laughs> see like, I think it would be really cool if we could see, you know, how you find a deal, maybe even call the deal as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a couple things you can do. Um, you can come, well, if we come over here, you have different lists, searches. So lists, if you click right here, these will be all of your different lists that you can create. So you can see I have all of these different ones that I have in here, like DC needs to call, Maryland needs to call, Nova um, RVA. So you can split your list however you want. I also have one for under contract and sold. Um, so that way, if I lose a deal, 
it goes under contract. I can, you know, go over here and I'm not calling on it anymore. So the whole point that I have this set up is, you know, me or my acquisitions rep, we log in in the morning, we click on DC needs a call or Maryland needs to call. We figure out exactly what properties we need to call. We go in, we call them. Um, and then we move them over to the called list. If they go under contract before we called them or after we move them to under contract. And if they get sold, we move to sold, get buyer's info. Um, so you can break up the list however you want. Another cool thing you can do inside the list is if you click on these little like icon things, it will literally show you where all of those saved properties are. Um, mm. And then if you come down here into searches, these are going to be where you have any searches that you have pre-saved. And I'll show you how you can do that in a little bit as well. And then those are really the only two that I use. I don't personally use contacts. I guess that's just um, like your internal team contacts. Um, okay, cool. So now that you know all that, let's go into actually finding deals. So you can go up here um, and type in an area that you want to look at. You can type in a zip code, however you want. So if we type in Jacksonville, it will circle Jacksonville. Now, if you do like more than Jacksonville, you can also come up here to this little, um, you know, pencil icon. And let's say we only wanted to do this side of the river or something. We could do that. You know, we could draw a giant circle around there. And now instead of giving us all of Jacksonville, it's only going to give us inside of this circle. Um, so once we do that, we can come over here to either fix and flip, pop top. You can click whatever one of these you want. I like to click on this and then hit um, find similar active deals. So then I'll do that. So it's going to go over there, just making sure it's showing us all of the fix and flips. And then from here, I like to jump into the filter section. And I'll kind of play around with the filters depending on my area. So let's say in Jacksonville, we know that sometimes people will buy up to 75%. So we'll do 75% and under. You could also click this show privy preferred, which is going to be like anything privy highly recommends um, that you go after. So, you know, you could click on that if you wanted to go after those first. And then typically from there, I'll come down and kind of play with like year build. So maybe we're only looking for 1990 and under because that's where most of our opportunities are coming from. If you wanted to, you could change the days on market. So if you wanted to look at 30 days and sooner, you could put that in there. I typically just leave it leave it alone. Um, and then if you wanted to narrow this down because we don't have it's not showing us all of them without clicking into it. So we could also do like, you know, let's say the past month. And then we could run search. And now it's going to show us instead of having Ooh. to click, in, it's going to narrow it down. And now what kind of properties are these are these right here? Like are these buy and holds, fix and flips, regular properties? Yeah, so these are gonna be considered what, what Privy's algorithm is considering a fix and flip property. So again, what it's looking at is the ARVs in the area. So it's looking at based on its algorithm, what similar properties for are reselling for. And then it's gonna take that information and say, based on what you put right here, 75%. So we'll use easy numbers right now. If the after repair value is a hundred thousand, Privy is saying anything that's seventy five thousand dollars and under, that's similar to this property is going to be shown. So it's pretty much using that algorithm to to run the info off of this. So we're looking for fix and flips that are seventy five percent ARV and under. Nice. So then we'll have like one ninety nine. Um, so this one, again, this is a privy preferred one. We can see that little icon. What I like to do is just quickly click through the pictures with the arrow buttons, <clears throat> because if you click into it like this, you actually have to click into them and scroll through it. So I like to just use the arrow buttons and then I'll have my cursor over here and I'll just go arrow, arrow, arrow. Does this look like a, an outdated property or could a first time home buyer live in it? To be honest, I think if it was cleaned up, a first time home buyer might pick this one up. So I would maybe just move along from this one. Um, but if you wanted to add it, you could just go over here to manage list and then you could add it. But let's say, let's just keep going and find one. Okay. So we're going through the pictures. We can see that this one is not updated. It definitely looks like it needs some work. So then we'll go over here, manage list, and then we'll go Jax needs to call and we'll hit save. 
And then I just keep going through them and looking for outdated properties. Um, this one, we can't really, okay, the picture's popped up. So again, this one, it's not like 2023 standard, but it's not in bad condition. So I think a homeowner, a first time home buyer, like a young couple would come in here and, and buy this one and not be too worried about the condition that it's in. So I would move on from this one. And again, we're going through. But why is that with the first time home buyer passing on anything that a first time home buyer might buy? Yeah. So the reason I pass on that is because um, now that's not to say like, for instance, this one is again, it's a nice home. Um, 189. That's a pretty good price. So, you know, we might add this one. But the reason that I, I say we don't want to. So, so the reason I compare is this a homeowner or is this an investor type property is because a lot of times first time home buyers, um, they're willing to pay more. Uh, it's their first house. They're excited about it. They're using an FHA loan. So, you know, their down payments are smaller. So they're, you know, able to get into it. But not only that, they're willing to take lesser condition properties, right? Because they're a first time home buyer. They're not someone who's, you know, looking for the nicest of the nicest because they're upgrading, right? They're mm -hmm. someone who is literally moving out of their parents' house or just graduating college and moving out of an apartment or a sorority or fraternity house, right? And now they're trying to find their first home to kind of call home. And like so they, it doesn't they have just want to get into something and they're willing to pay more than investors because they're going to live exactly. in it. They don't need cash flow. Exactly. And then on top of that, <laughs> um, you know, so, so that's why I got like, so they're willing to live in, in a lesser condition one. <clears throat> and so I always ask like, is this a first time home buyer or is this an investor? Now there are times where it's kind of 50, 50, right? You might have a first time home buyer and investors going after it. Um, and you can win against a first time home buyer because a lot of times we don't have contingencies where first time home buyers definitely have contingencies. So, you know, you just have to kind of ask yourself like, Hey, is, is, is this something that an investor would make an offer on? Or is this something that a first time home buyer is really comfortable living in? If you think a first time home buyer has no problem moving in and living there, I would probably just move on to the next opportunity. Mm. So again, going through it, we can see um, that it is outdated. And for those of you who are wondering what I look at when I look at outdated stuff. So again, it's going to depend on market. We can see right here the, the floors, right? Um, we have a, a air conditioner unit in the wall. So that's another indicator that it doesn't have like central air. Um, we can see that again, the staining on the floor. Sometimes they'll have wallpaper all over the wall, which is a, another indicator. Um, going into the kitchen. So the kitchen's not in terrible shape, but the newer kitchens will have the white, ca um, cabinets. They'll have like the white granite countertops. They'll have, these are stainless steel appliances. So these are kind of newer. A lot of times you won't see this kind of checkered backsplash like this. Again, it will be probably white. Um, and then you'll have like more, I guess, appealing floors like hardwood floors normally, or some type of white floors or whatever. And again, we can see that the wall is kind of some stuff's going on over there. Um, again, when you look at like the bathrooms, right? Uh, it, you just look at, look at what's brand new and then look at kind of recently or like the older stuff, right? So the brand new bathrooms, again, are more open. You have like the standing showers normally, and it's a lot of tile stuff, right? So the sliding glass door, um, and just regular stuff going on is probably another indicator. Hey bro, we got this good question in the side chat. It's kind of a bit of a off topic, but I think it's important that we have this question for Leah. Go uh, for it. Question is, is what do you do if the seller doesn't want to accept an assignable contract? <clears throat> Sometimes you will actually even see on Privy in the descriptions, the agents will put no assignments. Um, it's super easy. You can either number one, like negotiate and get yourself an assignment or number two, you can just double close it and you can use transactional funding to double close it. Yep. When, when you're um, negotiating the assignment, Jacob, like what, what does that dialogue sound like? 
Um, sorry, one second. I'm just replying to this buyer. Yeah, no problem, bro. All right, I'm sorry. What was that? When you're negotiating the assignment, what does that dialogue mm -hmm. sound like? Um, so like if a, you mean like when a, how am I negotiating the assignment term, like verbiage yeah, like on the an, contract? Yeah. Like if an agent, you know, you ask for assignment, the agent says no assignments. Yeah. So honestly, I, t I've never had to double close before. That's probably because in DC it's, it's more expensive to double close. Um, in Florida, there'll probably be plenty of times where I have to double close, but the one thing to my knowledge too, you want to keep in mind when you do double close is again, I'm not an accountant, so I don't know this for sure, but it's my understanding that you have to pay capital gains when you double close now, because you're essentially taking down a house and then quickly reselling it. So your taxes will mm -hmm. kind of shift a little bit. So definitely make sure you're, you stay on top of that. Um, if you do double close, but yeah, so if you don't want to double close, so it just stays, you know, the traditional way and someone's like real adamant about, um, you know, not assigning it. There's a couple different things that you can do. Um, you know, you could double close. You could also just get it under your name. And then if you find a buyer that you're close with, you could tell the buyer, Hey, we can't assign this. Um, so what I'm going to have to do is me and you are going to have to draft up a marketing agreement, like a, you know, you're going to pay me my assignment fee as a marketing fee for finding you this deal. And then we're just going to do an addendum and I'm going to put your name on the contract. And so now they're getting the contract at your price, but they're paying you a marketing fee. So I would only recommend that if you're close with the buyer. And then if you're adamant on keeping that and or assigns on the contract, um, you can do and or assigns. And again, I'm not an attorney. So, you know, by all means, talk to a someone who's in law and don't just take my word for it because I'm not an attorney by any means, nor do I practice law, but it's to my knowledge. And sometimes I do this. You can do and or signs or you can do and or designated entity. And if the buyer or the, the seller or the agent is, you know, giving you some kickback, you can tell them, hey, at this point, again, we're not sure what our exit strategy is. I'm not intending on assigning this one. Um, the assignment is really just to be able to move it over into my other companies if we need to take them down for tax reasons. Um, or you can be transparent and just be like, hey, like, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do my exit strategy as. Uh, I don't know if I'm taking this down as a flip, as a rental. I don't know if I'm going to assign it over to someone else. So I just need that to be an option. Um, but I think just explaining you know, why that's there and not blatantly just being like, oh, well, I'm wholesaling this and I need to find a buyer. So I need it assignable. Um, mm -hmm. And then a lot of times, like in, in, in Florida, there's a box that you can check that says it's a sign a bit, it's assignable, but you know, the liability stills remain remains with you. So I would recommend selecting that one over the one that releases liability. Uh, it just, it's, it's feels more clean. Um, but also keep in mind too, like in Jacksonville, if you don't select any boxes, mm -hmm. it says right under it, if no boxes are selected, the contract is assignable. Hmm. Really? So yeah, you just don't select the box and then they sign what? it and it's assignable. Why is it that Jacksonville has like their own unique contract versus like the regular Every, everyone, Farbar? Everyone does. Farbar really? is just, yeah, it's so each MLS has their own what you'll notice is each MLS and a lot of times each like, so for us, bright MLS covers like Maryland, DC and Virginia, mm -hmm. but, um, Maryland, Virginia and DC all use different contracts. And a lot of times, so something I learned recently, the contract, it's not like a, it's not like a state approved contract. It's not like, really? No, no, no. It's not, it's not like the state says you have to use this. What they do is the brokers will create, they'll have their attorneys create these contracts. And a lot of times mm -hmm. you'll have like NARS create the contract and then that will just kind of trickle down and you'll have different versions of it, but you can use whatever contract you want. Um, so like you don't have to use a far bar contract. It's just so standard because that's just became the norm at this point. And mm -hmm. so to my knowledge, you don't actually like have to use that in every jurisdiction or every broker might have a different contract and different terms that they want to include in there. But for the majority of it, they're going to be basically the same terms.
Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. I thought that the far bar was just standard, but it sounds like it's just the, the most common one. Yeah. And I think, um, <laughs> I mean, you could probably use a far bar in Jacksonville. Um, <laughs> again, it's just, yeah. you know, from, from my understanding, like I said, like Northern Virginia has their own contract. Like it's like the NVAR contract you have DC, which is like the GCAAR contract. And then you have like, um, the, I think it's like, there's like two versions of the Maryland one. There's like MREC. And then I think there's, um, MAR, like, I think you have MAR contracts and then the MREC contracts, but I could be wrong. Hmm. Here, yeah, uh, it gets complicated. Here pretty solid follow-up question to that. Go for it. Leo says, appreciate the answer, Jacob. Thanks. One more question in regards to something you mentioned. Does the seller have to sign off on the amendment when we create, we create with the buyer? I was told that before, and it can put a wrench in everything since the seller hasn't doesn't want it assigned in the first place. So, like, I believe that comes back to when you were talking about, you know, potentially yeah. getting creative and, and just having a name change amendment. Yeah, so you definitely have to have the, the so the seller has to sign the addendum for sure because they're the ones changing the contract names with the buyer, right? So they definitely need to have the addendum signed. Um but then you just tell them you're like you i'm not assigning it i literally just need the addendum name change if you can't do that then send me the cancellation does Who's, there does so, their fee uh, show up on the hud or is that like the buyer pays them outside of escrow if they do it that creative way um i think you can still have the marketing fee on on hud but the buyer could also 1099 outside of escrow mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter but uh, yeah i would just tell the seller too like at the end of the day, you're not assigning it. So if you came back to the seller and you said, hey, um, we're actually taking this down in another one of our companies or we're partnering with someone and we need an addendum to change the name over to this entity name. And they're like, no. And you hit them with, okay, well, where EMD's already in. We're ready to close. I just need the name change or else I'm not closing on this. Who in their right mind is gonna be like, no. I don't want my house to close because I don't want your entity name on this deed. You know what I'm saying? Like it sounds 99% of the people are going to be like, okay, so you're just doing a name change. Yeah, that's it. I just need an addendum name change. And they're going to be like, and you're still good to close next week. Yeah, we're still good. I'm be like, all right. <laughs> yeah. But if they really do kick back, then you just have to give them that ultimatum. Um, I mean, again, you could you could double close um the only other thing I, that you might be able to do that i wouldn't recommend but you could do like a lot of people do it in short sales is like if it was like something really weird like that you could just sell your llc ooh that sounds but, like super complicated nah it's 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 actually pretty simple you just sell your llc and the the members change and then your assignment fee becomes like like the llc i don't, I don't even know it's like a consultant fee i don't know what the hell happens interesting what if like someone has debt in their llc's name and then so it, it would have sent it would be name. um ideally it would be like a you just created so for instance if it was one two three main street you would have one two three main street llc and you would sell that LLC. It wouldn't be like your actual business because then you're selling your whole business and then then yeah. you're kind of screwed. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of work. It, it's possible, guys. But at, it, it better be worth your time if, if you're going to go through all those hoops. Yeah, exactly. Yo, you know, one thing that I think is really cool about Privy, and it might be a little bit off topic, but if you guys in the comments want this, um, we can actually show you how you find buyers on Privy as well. It can be a little bit of For like sure. how you find uh, MLS deals and how you find buyers. So I want you guys in the side chat, if you want to know how you can find fully vetted tax record buyers on Privy, then give me a thumbs up emoji in the side chat. If you want to know how you can find fully vetted tax record buyers on Privy, give me a thumbs up emoji in the side chat. I got I to gotta see a bunch of thumbs up emojis. How did you do that? Do Why don't I have a bubble? 
<clears throat> Watch this. I can make fireworks go off as well. Hey, where's my bubble? <laughs> I hope you're on a Mac. I am. Um, Are you updated to the oh, most recent bubble. operating system? <laughs> Boom. Bubble. You can also, like, make hearts come out. I never liked kombucha or kombucha. Yeah. I'm a fan. This is the passion fruit tangerine. That stuff is so good for your microbiome. I know, dude. And it's it's pretty tasty. Yeah. All right, guys. Give me give me these thumbs up. Am I doing this or am I not doing it? Are, are we gonna we're gonna go after these uh fix and fix and flip buyers? Mm -hmm. Let me see some more thumbs up. I wanna I wanna see more attention here. All right. Let me pop All this. Right, Ooh. All right, guys. Okay. Well, before we jump yes. in that too, did that did I cover the whole like how to find? Oh yeah, good point. Off. You guys, did you guys understand how to find MLS deals? The, maybe, maybe we got a little bit off track there. Yeah, I was gonna say we answered the question, and then I think I did though. I mean, just kind of go did. through and 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 mm -hmm. tweak the site. So one thing I will say too before we switch over, when you're doing the M or the MLS, um just like play with your arv because you'll like don't go to like 70 percent. i would recommend going higher than 70 percent. so like 80 percent. and the reason i do that is because again we have homeowners who aren't realistic sometimes so they might list their property higher than what the arv like that's 70 80 percent. but if it's outdated, we still might be able to reach out to them and get them down to 60% or something realistic down the road. So yeah, you know, play with the percentage. Um, and then for Zillow, same exact thing. You can draw the only difference on Zillow is use keywords and, and go look at my video on YouTube about Zillow and then you'll be good. But yeah, let's dive what, into what, cash buyers. What's the title of, of your video on YouTube? Um, I think how to find wholesale deals using Zillow. There you go. I've been Jacob Simpson REI, and I'm pretty sure <clears> it's <throat> like my one of my top ones. So you should. It's. I think it's my number one video, to be honest. It's a solid video. It's very useful. Yeah. All right, guys, you ready? Okay. So I'm going to try to make this as super simple as possible. So step one: fix and flip filter. Give it a second to load. And you're going to do this in your market. Okay. Now, as you can see, there's these big bubbles. Click on these big bubbles and it will spread out into smaller bubbles. Click on the next biggest bubble because that's where the most buyers are. And then it'll spread out again into a bunch of properties. So these are all most likely fix and flipped properties. And how can you tell? Well, I like to look at it from the grid. You don't have to if you don't want, but I just like to look at it this way. You can either one by one go through these or you can like just uh, pick out the ones that look like they were recently remodeled. So this one here looks like it was recently remodeled, sold on December 1st. And then if you want to confirm, scroll down to the bottom and you can look at the before and after. Sometimes it'll have MLS photos from before. Sometimes it won't. But as you can see, it didn't look too good before. It looks great afterwards. So it most likely was a flip. Well, if you go to the public records and you click on property history, you're going to see who bought it. So Top Rock Investments LLC purchased this property. Now, how do you find Top Rock Investments LLC? Well, you can go to Open Corporates. You can search it up. Okay, that didn't work in Open Corporates. We're going to go to Sunbiz. This is just the corporate search for Sunbiz. So search records by name. Drop the entity name in there. Here we go, right here, Top Rock Investments. Okay, so registered agent name and address. Usually that's the owner. 
Um, so as you can see here, we have the owner's name, Bernakara. I don't know how to pronounce that. Grab their address and go to true people search. Do a address name, search. That's the last name? Yeah, their first name would be Il Ilker or whatever it was. Ilker. Oh, here we go. And look, here's Ilker. Now, I'm not going to click on their information because YouTube might get mad at me once once I put that up there. Um, but yeah, you just click on that and their, their contact info is in there. So it's, it's so incredibly simple to find buyers on Privy. But I'm going to go through it one more time for you guys. Okay. And so let's not even, let's do it just on open corporates real quick. Because someone said, can you use that for Florida or other states as well? You can do it in other states. And I'll show you, go to open corporates. I'll show yep. you how to do it straight from open corporates. I tried the uh, I tried the um, the entity name in open corporates, and for some reason it didn't come up. Why don't I grab oh, okay. uh, a new one off of Privy first, and then so here we'll put that name up. back in there, and I'll see. I'll show you how we can figure it out. Okay, bet. Let me see. Oh, All right, so take weird. Actually, I, I don't know. Maybe I just did that <laughs> search. Here it is. No, you're good. So what I was going to say too is um, if it ever does do that, like let's say you put that in there and it didn't pop up, try taking out like the the last word. So take out like LLC or take out um, maybe take out the S in investments. So sometimes mm -hmm. what happens is it will pull in like a weird way. So like sometimes for instance, you'll have like Top, right, top Rock Investments Inc. But there'll be a comma after investments and before ink, but it won't show that on mm. the actual on, on like privy or something. It will be like some weird. So, so if you ever don't see them pop up, just start to like kind of take a little bit out of the actual entity name and see if one starts to pop up. Yep. No, that that's pretty solid. Um, yeah. I like, I like Jeffrey's question. Are these websites just for Florida or others as well? Um, so open corporates, you know, that's, that's pretty much everywhere that yeah. it even gives data in Canada, open corporates and other countries. Um, Sunbiz is exclusive to Florida. Uh, open corporates is like everywhere. Lewis says, what parts of Florida do you wholesale? So I do all of Florida. Jacob is like super, super into the Jacksonville market. So if you have Jacksonville yeah. stuff, uh, Jacob is your man. Um, yeah, uh, and then he also said, how does the new rules from NAR affect us when going directly to the listing agent now that they want the buyer to pay for the buyer's agent's commission? So I think is Jamil, real, I, is that like actually solidified yet? Or is that just kind of mm -hmm. in the talks? So I think they're, it did get solidified, but I think they're countering. I think they're trying to start suing. Like they're trying to counter sue to make it not happen. Um, but I don't think it's going it, to, it doesn't affect us at all. And the reason, and Jamil made some really, really, really good points on this. So, okay. So the main point is we don't use a buyer's agent. We go in unrepresented a lot of times or they dual represent. So if we go in without a buyer's agent, who cares? Like no one has to pay an agent anyway. So we're not worried about that. Um, if we do use a buyer's agent, and the seller isn't responsible for them paying, um, what will end up happening is we'll have to pay, you know, a portion of our assignment fee to the buyer's agent, which is not a huge deal because, you know, they're helping us get the deal. Um, now, I don't think it's necessarily saying either that the buyer's agent's commission is going away completely from the seller side. I think what it was saying, and it might be going just to the buyer side, but I think what the lawsuit was mainly about was that NAR was holding a standard and not really allowing a, a negotiation. So they were coming in saying 3% to the buyer's agent, 3% to the seller's agent. And that was kind of what they were pushing on everyone instead of letting it be negotiable. Um, and so I think that was where the real issue came in at. But the other thing is, Two points that Jamil made that I, I think are really great. One, this is going to take forever to be implemented. Like we're going it, to, it's not like it's going to happen tomorrow. This is going to take years 
like it could take five, six years for all of this to pan out. Cause you're going to have lawsuits, counter lawsuits, you know, th- that regulations are going to need to be changed. Like it's going to take a long time for things to, to figure out how to work. The other issue that's going to happen is you have a lot of first time home buyers buying properties, right? And a first time home buyer is someone who's like twenties, you know, they don't really have a lot of money saved up. You know, maybe that down payment, even if it's only 3%, that that's a lot to them. And maybe that's all their savings that they had at the time. And so they're kind of like, okay, you know, let's put this in. If now you say, Hey, Mr. And Mrs. New homeowner, you have to pay the buyer's agent a commission. So now they have to come to the table with potential closing costs. They have to come to the table with their down payment. And now they have to pay an agent. They could barely afford any of the other fees prior to that. So what's going to happen, I think, is a lot of buyer's agents aren't going to want to do their job. Like what's the incentive to go help a first time home buyer find a house if you're not even sure that they can pay you the commission? Or now your commission's super low. And so I think it's just going to be really, like it's going to take forever. But honestly, I don't think much is going to change. And when it does change, I think they're going to realize that they had it set up the way they did for a reason. Mm -hmm. And then it's just going to go back to the seller paying it. Unless it's like investors. Because again, I don't see it being reasonable that a first time home buyer comes to the table with 3% plus closing costs, plus any other stuff they need to pay, plus having to pay another agent their commission. And someone else in the comments too, like my brokerage is still doing business as usual with regards to commissions. If they need a commission, we pay a portion of our assignment fee to the agent if need be. So I don't think a lot is going to change for now. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. And when it does, we just change. I mean, as wholesalers, that's what we we do. We adapt to the markets. That's the beauty of wholesaling. You know, if regulation happens, get your license. Boom. If regulation happens, double close. You know what I'm saying? Like there, there are so many ways that we can figure out to adapt and move. So don't worry about it. Just, you know, take note of it and, and pay attention to what's happening. I like that, bro. You know, as wholesalers, as real estate investors in general, we, we adapt. There's a lot of people, a lot of agents I get that will either text me one of two responses, either, you know, the market's good or the market's bad. And it's like, whether it's a good market or a bad market, like it's all about how we respond to it. Yep. And a great market, like this is why I love what we do, right? When the market is going fantastic, there's more deals for us because, or there's a lot of deals for us and there's a lot of buyers. When the market is doing bad, there's even more deals for us. There's just a little bit less buyers. Mm -hmm. So there's always deals for us. When the market goes completely tanks, our assignment fees might go down, but there's going to be true buyers still, guarantee it. And we're going to be the ones finding the deal still. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like it, bro. I like it. What other questions do you guys have? I think I think a Q&A is is pretty pretty nice. Cuz we can only go over privy so many times and you guys can always rewind. So, unless if you want us to sound like a broken record, let's uh let's get some questions flowing in the side chat. What up Cody? How you doing, bro? Dude, Cody is a G. Bro, he's taken this this live streaming like super seriously. <laughs> That's awesome. You see, he's going like literally every day. He hasn't invited me to his live yet. (laughs) I'm going to have to just pull up to your office. He's going to be like, yo, play some Fortnite. Come on my live. Dude, I was telling him, I was like, yo, I'll play some Fortnite and make some calls with you. Yeah. I like like this one here. What is the average assignment fee in Florida? What are we talking? Direct to seller, agent outreach, or off the MLS? That's an interesting question. That's kind of a hard one to answer. Um, I can say that our assignment fees, I would say on average, are about like 
four thousand, five thousand bucks, and we do agent outreach or sorry, uh, MLS outreach. But also, whenever we do MLS outreach, whenever we make an offer, that agent afterwards turns into like a pocket listing agent where they bring us stuff before it hits the MLS. So we have a bit of combined uh, MLS outreach and pocket listings, and we get about four to five thousand dollars on average. A, and a bunch you, of little ones, and then a couple of like home runs. And are you um, having dispo wholesalers sell them, or what's the breakdown like? Is it all your assignment fee? For the most part, like we'll we'll sell them ourselves. Um, I just had a dispo, like we just had one with an eighteen thousand dollars spread, but I had a mm-hmm. dispo wholesaler sell it, so that brings us down to like, I don't know, half of that, whatever the number equals out to. Yeah, yeah. So I was gonna say it really depends. There's a lot of stuff that go into it, so I would say for Florida, I would say that I've seen the average MLS fee. like total is typically like 10, 10 to 15 grand I've seen, but normally there's multiple hands involved in the mix. So realistically like five to 10 is what you'll walk away with. Um, I would say agent outreach. I would say realistically agent outreach is probably going to be like 10 to 20 because they're going to be more off market deals. And then I would say off market, it can really swing off market. I would say you're probably between like 10 and 40 because you know, you can get some pretty nice clips um, off market. It just takes a little bit longer. Uh, and then micro flips, like working with other wholesalers and JVs and stuff, I, I would say like probably like two to six is your Dude, the micro the micro flips are so tight. I literally just sold one and I'm making zero dollars. Yeah, bro. Me. It hurts. Like, it hurts my soul when that happens. Because up here, bro, I'll make some good spreads. And then when I see in Florida, I, like one time I made like 1500 or something. And I was like, bro, I just spent so much time to make 1500 bucks. Like, right. Just but shows that I wasn't right grateful side, in the moment, though. Because I should yeah. be like, dude, the 1500 to just sell a contract. I know, right? But dude, on the bright side, like I made $0 on this one. But I, I still have an opportunity for, for a retrade. So hopefully I can get it. If not, whatever. But I was able to help somebody get their first deal and I was able to, you know, find a buyer for it so I didn't have to cancel. So I'm I'm happy either way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, I've done deals for zero dollars as well. At the end of the day, like you said, it's so we in this, okay. So wholesaling is great because we can make a lot of money and we can provide a lot of value, but it's also relationships over revenue. But more importantly, we put the sellers first. So to your point. You know, you were making zero dollars. You could have had your ego involved and say, no, I need to make something on this one. I'm not working for free. But what would have happened? That house could have not closed. That seller would have been in a a weird situation. But you took the high road and you said, you know what? I'm going to main, I'm going to create these relationships. I'm going to help someone get their first deal closed. I'm going to help this homeowner sell their house. I'm cool with making zero on this one. That's ideally not what I can, you know, ideally we don't make zero, but this is the case for this certain situation and I'm happy to get it done to make sure that everyone involved is settled and, and the value was provided. And I think that's yeah. how most wholesalers need to approach it because dude, I've been in some deals with some shady wholesalers where it's like, I don't give a shit about the homeowner. I don't care what's going on with the agent. I need my money. And if I don't get it, it can fall apart. Homeowner can get foreclosed on yeah. who cares. Dude, those people, like, I feel as though those people think that, like, they're never going to get another deal. Like, they're so, so desperate, so limited mindset that, like, they feel like that's the only one they're going to get. I I know there's going to be many more for me. So it's like, it's whatever. You know, if if I can't eat on a deal, I'm not going to tell other people that they can't eat either. Like, that's just not fair. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, to your point, that's such a scarce mentality to have to be like, uh, oh, like, to think that you're not going to ever get those deals again and try to get, because now you close that deal, who's the wholesaler going to send their deals to the buyer knows you're serious and you provide value. So it's like, you're going to make so much more money off of that $0 transaction than if you were to fight for, you know, $2,500 to get out of it. Not only that, but like, if you tell them that you made $0 off of it, they're like, damn, this is a person I want to work with. Right. And then they're going to look out for you going for, Hey bro, last time you made zero dog, you can't do that again. We got to make you at least five. And you're like, appreciate you, bro. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, how about this? How do you pitch buyers to work with you? I don't I don't think you have to pitch them to be honest. I just send like, them a deal. Yeah. I'm like, yo, I have a deal. You I, it's near your house that you just flipped. Are you interested? And they're like, Yeah. Okay. Now, what if they don't have a deal? What if they're just getting started? They're trying to build up a buyer's list. They don't have a deal yet. How do they convince a buyer that, you know, it's worthwhile saving their contact? Um, so in that case, I would just call them and I would be or text them. Hey, I saw you recently flipped a property or bought a property at 123 Main Street. Um, you know, I'm actually a, an investor in the area or, or a wholesaler. I'm a wholesaler in the area. I come across deals all the time. Um, I really just wanted to reach out and see if you were actively looking for new properties to take down. And if they're like, yeah, you're like, sweet, man, you got a couple minutes where I can just grab your information or your criteria so I can, you know, send you the best fit deals. And they're like, yay or nay. And then from there, you gather their criteria. You know, what are you looking for? Is there any specific areas, price points, um, you know, year build? Again, just grab their regular criteria. And then from there, you go out and find them a deal and you start to send them some deals and, you know, treat them like a human and build the relationship and don't just look at them as someone who buys your deals and it'll go a long way. I think, I think a really big thing is like thanking them for looking at your deals. Like if you send them a deal and it's not a deal and they give you feedback on it, make sure you're showing gratitude for them looking at their deal at your deal because they're busy, right? They're only working with wholesalers because they're too busy to be out looking for the deals themselves. So if they look at your deal and it's not a deal, and if you want them to continue looking at your deals, make sure you recognize the effort that goes into them looking at your deals. Like, all our buyers, whenever we send them a deal, if they don't want it, if they do want it, you know, we always say, hey, thank you for taking a look at that. Thank you for giving us feedback on that. And they really, really appreciate it because they know for that, sure. like, you know, they're valued. Yeah, exactly. You're not just sending them a deal. They look at it, tell you some feedback, and then you never respond. Yeah. Like, that's the worst. They're like, why did I even look at this thing? Yeah. Um, yes, I have a bunch of family down there. So just let me know if you need someone or what you're Perfect. working with. How do, how do they get a hold of you, though? You got to um i'm pretty sure leo i'm pretty sure you have my info but um yeah i'm real jacob simpson you see his tag right here go dm him. go Go send him pictures of your cat or your feet whatever you like tell him send him pictures of of your feet and like tag nathan say say it came from this live stream send me your only fans link (laughs) yeah um I want to know what you do outside of real estate. No, I'm just joking. Bro, did Please. you see Rocky's comment the other day? In the yeah, Facebook I was cracking group? up. Dude, I thought that was so funny. I'm like, you didn't send me that discount code. <laughs> you know, I'm doing a, uh, I'm, I'm doing a really cool event with him on Friday. Um, so have you ever seen like my AI vision board? No. Okay. So here, let me, let me share it with you guys. This is going to be like a little quick sneak peek. Dude, I think like the biggest thing with people getting started out is they don't have clarity, bro. Like they don't know exactly what they want. All right. So this is this is my AI vision board. All of these images I generated with AI. This um this letter to myself, I generated it like I put all my information in, but then I had AI phrase it mm-hmm. in a way that makes sense. It's right. It's like, dear future Nathan, I'm delighted to write this letter to you, reflecting on the remarkable developments you've made in yourself. Your journey has been nothing short of inspiring, and witnessing your growth brings me immense joy. First and foremost, I want to commend you on your unwavering positivity, contagious laughter, beacon of joy, spreading uplifting energy during challenging times. You find solace in the small things, maintain gratitude, yada yada yada, right? So Mm -hmm. I have, I have this letter that I wrote to myself and I had AI help me write this letter. But then what gets really, really cool about this is I actually have AI generated images as well that goes along with it. So like one of my things is being financially responsible in that letter. So here's an image of me being financially responsible, you know, like building up rising star investment. Here's an image of me and my partner building up rising star investment. I couldn't figure out how to put my faces on it, but whatever. Um, here's me yeah. being calm and, and, you know, being mindful. Here's me being charitable, you know, me with my Tesla model X, me as an astronaut, this one is like coming, coming later. I just added these extra ones. Um, and then over here, 
on the other side, right? We have more like um, me being studious, um, development projects, you know, me being intentional, I think that one is, uh, me being wealthy, <laughs> me exploring and having adventure, right? So this is like a really cool, cool event that we have coming up on Friday. Literally, this is just just to help people getting started. Uh, we just want people to like get clarity on their goals and whatnot. Oh, so yeah. we're gonna do like an AI vision board thing, bro. I'm I'm super excited. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah, AI is pretty cool. <clears throat> I'm a fan. Dude. How how are you using AI in your business? Um, I don't even know. I'd have to really think about. It. It's like I just kind of use it. Like I use ChatGPT all the time. Mm -hmm. just for like random questions and like so for example the other day i was trying to figure out how to like put together a website right i was building my website yeah. and i had no idea i no, no no actually it wasn't the website i was trying to put together the interactive tours because it was one of them wasn't working and i needed mm -hmm. to figure out long story short i had to figure out how to find an x path so like i didn't know what the heck an x path was so i just asked chat gpt and it told me how to get the x path and then, that, and then I, I'm part coding now. And I don't then, even know like, what the hell path means. Exactly. I just figured it out from chat. I still don't know what it means. I just know how to find it. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, and then like before for the, um, for my spreadsheet, right? Some of the stuff like uh, I, I couldn't figure out the conversions or something like that. And I'm like, write me the formula for exactly what I was looking for to do. And then chat GPT mm -hmm. spits out the formula for Excel um you know i've used it for i use ai for editing some of my videos um dude can i, I mean, give you I a really a really really good sauce with the ai yeah do you have the chat gpt app yeah okay do you have chat gpt4 no dude i when okay. they i literally went to go sign up and then they put the the wait list up i was like Bro. you can get it now you're good you, oh, should, you, be able, you should be able to get it now yeah but dude, here's what I recommend. Is it worth it? Oh, 100%. Bro. Okay. 100%. That's really why I didn't buy it. Cause I'm like, I don't know if this is worth it or not. Let me tell you why it's worth it, bro. Download the chat GPT app and all of you guys as well. You should be doing this as well. And if you want to participate in the vision board challenge, you need to be using chat GPT. If you want the best results, you need chat GPT for. So download I'm chat still GPT. Still in a wait list. Oh crap. Okay. You, all Either good, way. but just keep going. Either way. Yeah. Okay, you get the app, bro, and you can actually talk with it. So I put my AirPods in when I'm driving or when I'm going for walks, I put my AirPods in. I have a conversation with ChatGPT. I'll be like, hey, you know, this is the current problem that I'm going through in my business. Like, help me propose some solutions to it. I'll explain my problem and, and I'll get some feedback. Or I can say like, hey, are you familiar with the invisible counselors technique from the Napoleon Hill Think and Grow Rich book where you put a bunch of different people at different seats at a table, an imaginary council, and you know you propose your question or your problem to the council and they all give you feedback from their perspectives. So I'll be like, okay, I want Jamil Damji, Jerry Norton, Brent Daniels, Vina Jetty, Pace Morby, Grant Cardone, fire, Ryan Pineda, all of these people at my table. And then I'm like, this is a current challenge that I'm going through in my business. Like I give them a full breakdown, like full, full story, full explanation. And then it goes around the table and gives me answers from all of their perspectives. So that's, that's another thing. Another thing is you can say like, Hey, are you familiar with this book or like this paid course? Dude, I literally am able to get summaries of like paid courses through chat GPT four. Um, that's crazy. And and I'll, I'll be driving, dude. And like, I was able to consume like five books in a matter of like a two hour drive. And I'm like, are you familiar with like traction and the entrepreneur operating system? Yeah, I'm familiar with traction, yada, yada, yada. Here's a summary. Um, and I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, how do I apply that to my business? And ChatGPT has some custom instructions with like, this is, this is, this is me. This is my business. This is how it's best for you to speak to me. I like to do three-way communication where I, you tell me, I tell you back, and then you confirm if I understand it correctly. Like these are the different, you know, people in my life. Like I have Ernesto, my business partner, you know, these are, I just give it as much information about me as possible. And everything it does is cater to me. So when I'm speaking with it, I have very high level conversations and we play three-way communication all the time where it speaks to me. I speak to it and it speaks back to me to confirm that I know what it said. That's fire. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely fire. I need to, uh, how do I get on the wait list? <laughs> Let me I'll buy just, it. 
Go put yourself on the wait list. Damn, dude. I didn't realize that there's a wait list right now because we have the AI vision board challenge coming up tomorrow. We, we can do a workaround for it. How do I skip the wait list? Yeah, bro. Yeah, dude, I was literally about to sign up for it. I'm not even exaggerating. And I was like in the midst of doing reviews. And then the day that I decided I was going to buy it, I go to buy it and it was like waitlist. And I was like, huh? What the hell just happened? Yeah. And then that was when like the CEO was like stepping down or whatever was going on. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh, dude, why did I have to wait one day? Like, damn, bro. Yeah. It's all good. That's the timing of the I, world. Ask Chat GPT how to get past the wait list, Jeffrey says. Oh, I'm about to. Yeah, dude, you can do like plugins and whatnot. Oh, it's crazy. We'll have to have a whole uh, live stream just on AI in real estate. I did that, but I did kind of a crappy one last time. So a higher level one. Yeah, I was trying to because when they when they did Chat GPT for Turbo or whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. And they yep. brought it up to the up to 2023. That's when I was like, all right, let me buy the premium one. And so I was doing research on that. And then literally the next day I went to go buy it. And bro, I'm so it. eager to sell. Somebody says like this can make you money. Boom, buy it. Well, I never, I never no one, I never talked to anyone about it. So it was just kind of like me using Chat GPT and I would like look at it and I'd be like, Yeah, but what's the point of upgrading? And then when they came out with Turbo, I was like, all right, 2023 is pretty relevant. But then I started doing the research and I was like, oh man, it's like more accurate answers. Like it's, it's, just, it's a lot more that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, bro. Well, dude, I think this is a pretty damn good show. What do you guys think? You guys like it? Give me some thumbs up or some fire emojis in the side chat if you liked it. All right, guys. Well, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me, Jacob. Thank you for giving us that presentation on MLS, how to find thank deals. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, bro. And I will see you guys all in the next one. See ya. See ya.